Anyone that's an artist, you know that there's, there's really creative parts about making art. And then there's also the technical side where you just have to spend a lot of time doing some really tedious work to make sure that the art comes out great. And I, I thought to myself, what if I can get a robot, an AI, to do the tedious things and leave the creative things up to me? So my whole goal is to try and make this robot as creative as I am. And, and I know it'll never be an artist because I'm the artist and it, it doesn't have a message that it wants to tell people. But I do think that I can actually codify my creative process. This has just been 15 years back and forth trying to make it more and more creative every time, trying to make it more like me when I paint. And in this process, I've not only learned a lot about myself, I've learned a lot about creativity, I've learned a lot about human creativity, and, and I've learned a lot about how my own brain works. And, and that's really exciting for me. I'm Pindar Van Armen, I'm an AI artist. Uh, also consider myself a crypto artist. Uh, and I make art with artificial intelligence. A lot of us, just we just have a need to create whatever that creative urge is. And, and for me, it came into painting. But then, you know, to make ends meet, I got into graphic design and I became a graphic designer right at the dot-com around 2000. Uh, and at that point, I noticed that uh, a lot of the people at this company I was at were learning programming and, and becoming very successful with programming. So I thought I'd give it a shot and it just came easy to me. And I started um, dabbling with making art with all the technology I was learning. And I did that for about five years until a friend told me about uh, this big contest called the uh, DARPA Grand Challenge. The government put up a million dollar reward to anyone that could win a race. The catch, of course, was that this race with cars uh, couldn't have a driver. And all of us had spent about a year designing these self-driving cars, doing all the artificial intelligence. We were the sixth, we didn't finish, we uh, crashed into a tree at 82 miles. But I left that project like really deep in artificial intelligence and wanting to do my own AI art project. I started looking around for AI art projects I could apply you know, my skills to. And I thought to myself, what if I had this AI help me with my art? In the very beginning, when I was designing my first painting robots, it wasn't to make these amazing painting robots that are gonna be artificially creative. My family was just starting out. And all of a sudden, I found myself spending more and more time with my children. I just started thinking about, is there a way I could start painting again while also putting my kids to sleep every night? And so the very first painting robots were just these practical machines that were supposed to buy me time. As I made my painting robots, I started realizing I could have them do more, like I could have them help me out with contrast, actually help me out with compositions. These are very simple AI algorithms. And then uh, one day I set up a robot, I started painting. I went away and I came back at night to see how it's doing. And there it was sometime during the day and I don't know when it dropped its brush but it was painting away really blindly. And then it occurred to me, as like, this is just a printer. I thought to myself, what would make this machine intelligence? And that was the breakthrough. It had to actually look at and watch what it was doing and react to it. And, and this goes all the way back to Paul Clay, the painter. He mentioned the creative process as an artist makes a brush stroke, takes a step back, looks at that brush stroke, wonders what it's doing on the canvas, and then based on that brush stroke, makes another brush stroke over and over again, and then maybe halfway through the painting, takes a big step back and says, where is this painting at? And I realized until my robots were doing that, they were just simply blindly painting by numbers. And so the big breakthrough is at that point, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna put a camera on this and I'm gonna have the robots take pictures constantly, and then they're gonna make their future decisions based on what's happening on the canvas. From that point on, the AI kind of exploded. Now that it could interact and react to what was happening on the canvas, I could write a quick algorithm that would say, hey, control the contrast. And the robot would be painting, and every couple hundred strokes, it'd look for contrast. If contrast was bad, it would adjust and paint the whites whiter and the darks darker. There's two, there's two basic kinds of paintings I do. One is where I leave the robot by itself and it's just a test of how smart it has become, how creative it has become. About 25% of those paintings come out good. And when I say good, they rarely come out great because of course it doesn't have the, uh, it doesn't have the sophistication of a human artist looking at it. But the other kind of art I make is where I work very closely with my robots, back and forth. I might check on it every four hours and I might see what algorithm is it running. Is it trying to increase the contrast or you know, is it trying to make the colors more vibrant? And I'll tweak it. I'll, like, I'll actually play with the levers and give it a direction and push it to do things that I want it to do. One comes out a lot better than the other. But it is still interesting to see what it can do on its own. So every so often I just see what it can do on its own.
In the beginning, the AI was really easy. Like for example, I used K-means clustering to, to separate the colors and cluster parts of the canvas into different colors. And then once I added the feedback loops, which is the process by which the robot would take pictures, uh, study the picture to see what it needs to do next, everything got a lot more complex. And I started wondering if the robot could actually be truly creative. And I looked into it and I learned about deep learning. And then I started seeing what deep learning could do and I wrote my first deep learning algorithm style transfers. A lot of people have used this in their phones. You use the filter and it'll turn your photo into a Van Gogh. And I thought, wow, you know, this algorithm is actually adding style. And then I started looking at more and I started learning about another one, generative adversarial networks, a different kind of neural network. And it's not actually one neural network, but it's two and the two are arguing with each other. What happens is one network is charged with imagining things, and just randomly imagining things, and the other network is charged with critiquing what the, the first one's coming up with, and giving the critique to the first network, and, and the first network responds to the criticism. It's trained on something, anything. For example, let's use faces, because I do a lot of portraits. I will show my GANs 10,000 faces, 10,000 portraits, and it will study them. After the GAN has studied 10,000 faces, it will then get in an argument with itself where it tries to create new faces from nothing. And you gotta imagine it's two different neural networks. One of them has seen 10,000 faces, is an absolute expert. The other is naive, has never seen a face before, but it tries its best. It's like an artist just trying to create something. The expert says, you know what, you're trying to make a face, but it's not quite there, try again. But it doesn't just say try again, it gives it a little bit of knowledge, a little, it trades a little bit of its statistics to the other GAN, trains it just a touch. After about 4,000 iterations, very quickly, this GAN that's trying to imagine a face will actually start imagining some pretty realistic faces. The new faces that are being imagined by these GANs have never existed before. They're completely artificial, and they don't look like anyone, but they still look like faces. You train this GAN on something, and it will start creating artificial versions of that, and the artificial versions of that are remarkably creative. The creative mind of the robot's actually 24 different AI algorithms fighting with each other. And the way it does that is that it's been trained. And I train these GANs on a lot of things. One is historical art. Another thing I train the GANs are is all the art that my robots have made previously. And from this historical art and previous art, it, it tries to mix them all together and then create something new. And this is made to mimic Marvin Minsky's Society of Minds. He has a theory that our mind isn't just a single mind governing our actions. Dozens, perhaps hundreds, maybe thousands of different minds in our head, all trying to guide what we're doing. So in the same way, my robot has 20, about 24 different algorithms, and they're all fighting for control of the brush. And if you watch the robot painting, you can actually see the different minds come to the forefront and take over. Like there's an eye somewhere in the painting, and it's, it'll, it'll concentrate and develop that eye. Another algorithm I have will sharpen the details around an eye because it's very important that eyes are symmetrical. If the robot realizes that the eyes aren't symmetrical and it's doing a portrait, it'll actually give a lot of attention to making the eye symmetrical. I turn some of them on and off at times. They have different levers and different volumes, but they're all trying to influence what's happening with the painting. Bitcans are my most recent AI project and it's gone in the opposite direction of everyone else and it's actually getting a lot of attention because of that. So I start with these pixelated images, 32 by 32, thousands of them. A lot of them are handmade, some of them are made by combining the handmade ones, but all of them are unique and, and all of them are fed into a generative adversarial network which then studies them and then creates bitcans. And when you look at these bitcans, that's what you'll see. You'll see a pixelated field and it'll be look like static and slowly images will emerge and then all of a sudden you'll see what I'm calling a bitcan and it'll appear, it'll dance around a little and it'll disappear, almost dreamlike. I love the way they look, but I think a lot of it has to do with that there's something familiar about how BitGANs move around. And I think that's because there's something familiar about how these generative adversarial networks are creating them compared to with how our own brains create things. One of the things that I've noticed about the whole AI art industry is, is we are obsessed with, you know, how big our neural networks are. And, and that seems to be driving it. And for some reason, that's never spoken to me. So what, what's spoken to me is the story behind what the AI is doing or emotions. And so all this time I've been trying to uh, be super technical and cutting edge when it comes to neural networks. All I had to do was make something that spoke to people personally. A whole community has popped up around the BitGANs and I didn't see this happen. I just released 64 bit GANs as NFTs. I guess they caught people's imagination. There was a rush for them. An NFT is a non fungible token. That's a lot of words that people don't understand together. But what it basically means is that 
There is now a way through cryptocurrency to make digital art unique. And by unique, I mean only one person can own it. And this has been a very good boon for AI artists, uh, all digital artists, because we finally have a way to be taken seriously and, and finally have a way to give value uh, to this art. The BitCans are one of those ideas that, like, I don't even know if it's my own idea as much as all these BitGAN enthusiasts that are getting involved. And there's actually a plan to teach uh, the community how to make them as soon as uh, 1,000 and and 24 have been made. The last half of the project, I'm gonna release everything to the uh, to anyone that's interested. We're gonna open source it, and I'm gonna show everyone how to make BitGANs, and we're gonna see where that goes. And my big hope is that this is something that brings people into AI art. This would be an absolute smashing success if it got even a couple dozen people into AI art and showed them how interesting that was, but I'm hoping for far more. The future of AI and art is probably gonna be very similar to the future of AI in every single job category. Because we're just gonna have AI be very, very capable assistance for us for whatever we do. And it's gonna be the same with art. I often get artist block, or similar to writer's block. And whenever that happens, I just turn the AI on and ask the AI to make some images. And it starts making images and I don't even have to worry about it. I can just go away for an hour and come back and sometimes it breaks right through my artist block. So I see AI as being, in the short term, AI is gonna become very good studio assistants. Longer term, I'm actually very bullish on the fact that general AI will emerge. And by general AI, I mean we'll have artificially intelligent, sentient beings. Uh, machines. What's really interesting about thinking about sentient machines is thinking about the art they would make. But you know, in the same way that we have different cultures on this planet and American art's much more interesting to Americans than, for example, let's say Bengalese art is interesting to Americans and vice versa, I imagine it'd be its own genre and enjoyed by its own artists and creators and patrons, robots. I think the long-term future is robots are going to be creating art definitely, but I think the big fans are going to be other robots. It's sometimes controversial when I say this, but codifying my creative process and teaching it to a, a robot has made me realize that creativity isn't a purely human endeavor. I'm noticing that robots and machines can create a lot. There's once someone uh, created a Pollock bot, and the Pollock bot would follow Jackson Pollock's process to the T, you know, you drip paint and drip paint and even white and black paint in even quantities and, and the painting came out looking very much like a Jackson Pollock. I realized that a lot of artists have these processes and a lot of these processes are just algorithms that they repeat over and over and over again and that gives that artist the look and that look can be replicated by a machine and it just made me think that creativity for us is is a brand or is, is something that gives us a look, but it's not a differentiator from machines. There's this general narrative that the machines are coming to take our jobs and, and make us irrelevant, but I don't see it like that at all. I'm no more threatened by uh, AI becoming an artist than I am by uh, a human graduating art school. I'm interested in what it has to say about the universe if or whatever becomes sentient and makes art. I think that'll be fascinating. And I think it'd be fascinating, you know, all of a sudden we would have someone that shares, like, what are we doing here from its perspective? But I'm not threatened by it, nor should anyone be. There's room for everyone.